<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to our session today on hacking the I can't get a job without experience cycle, featuring a number of guests from uh, graduate school admissions uh, office, as well as an employer. You'll hear a little bit more from them in a moment. Uh, just as we get started, I would like to make sure everyone is aware that we are recording today. You are invited to adjust your behavior accordingly uh, in case you would like to not be featured in the recording. Uh, the recording link will be sent to everyone uh, when the presentation is over. I'll introduce myself very quickly. I'm Jen. I'm the manager of the Career Development Services at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, uh, and I'm going to do a little intro for you on uh, what this cycle is all about. Before I do that, though, we'd like to acknowledge where we are. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. All right. So, uh, as I said, uh, today we're going to be hearing from a number of recruiters talking about further education as well as preparing for employment. Uh, and I'd like to share with you that whichever direction you think you're going in, it's going to be okay to change your mind because the preparation is essentially the same. So, of course, for going on in further education, uh, professional and graduate schools might ask for high grades. Employers often will not ask you for your grades. However, they are looking for examples of your ability to perform. And so you could use your grades as that measure of performance. And certainly there are other things that you could use, but that's one example. Further education programs and employers would like you to have experience. That's what we're emphasizing today. And we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but further education uh, is often looking for paid experience and or volunteer experience and or campus experience. Same for employers. They're interested in seeing sort of how you have engaged, what skills you've developed. Uh, and um, again, you can use these things as a measure of your ability to perform. Uh, for further education and employment, both you are likely to have an interview. Uh, further education, actually, I'd say it's more common than not, in my experience with students recently, for there be to, to be some kind of interview at some point in the process. And of course, for employment, Honestly, if some organization wants to offer you a job and they have never spoken with you, I would be suspicious. Just put that out there. So an interview is, is, is a very, very common experience. And again, you'll want stories to talk about, and that's where your experience comes in. Uh, with regard to further education, you're going to provide a couple of documents when you apply. Those are typically called a personal statement and a CV. They are very much like a cover letter and a resume. Of course, for further education, the personal and statement, the personal statement and CV are much more academically focused. They might talk about essays and class projects to a great extent. Whereas for employment, uh, your cover letter and your resume are going to be highlights, if you will. Resume is from the French résumé, which is a verb meaning summarize. An employer is interested in just the good stuff, not interested in necessarily your life history, uh, which might actually be more relevant to uh, a further education outcome. Uh, with regard to further education, they might ask for specific courses. So for example, a uh, course in statistics is, is often desirable if you're going into the social sciences or uh, sometimes even the life sciences. So um, sometimes, you know, that's a requirement for employment. You won't usually see a specific course requested, but you'll often see a background preferred. So for example, uh, a job posting might say, you know, this role is probably a good fit for someone with a sociology or psychology background because of the kinds of um, research strategies that you might have learned for, uh, for further education uh, admissions testing is quite common I'm sure you've heard of the infamous MCAT in regard to medical school the LSAT for law school uh, those of you who are pursuing research may have heard of the GRE these are all standardized admissions tests that try to give an admissions committee insight into what it is uh, that you're really good at uh, on dimensions that they're particularly interested mathematics, sometimes it's uh, language and vocabulary, sometimes it's logic, all depends on, again, what they're looking for. 
For employment, skills testing comes and goes. I'm gonna say sometimes it's in fashion, sometimes it's out of fashion, seems to be back in right now. So please don't be surprised if an employer that you're talking to tells you that as part of the recruiting process, they're going to ask you to complete some kind of assessment or activity or project. It's actually a great opportunity for you to really show off what it is that you can do. Again, a dimension that they're particularly interested in. And finally, references. So for further education, of course, you're going to need reference letters. Typically, you're going to need at least one, sometimes two or even three from faculty members. Uh, but they could also be from a boss and that boss could be from paid employment or volunteer employment. Again, depends on the program. A professional program typically will want one of each as an example, one from a prof, one from uh, someone who knows you well, like a, a former boss. Uh, and then for employment, typically employers still want somebody they can call. Uh, they're not usually interested in reference letters. They usually want someone to call to ask very specific questions, again, about the skills and characteristics that you would bring to uh, their uh, organization. And you can imagine, this takes a little time to develop. I noticed someone said in the chat that, that you're in fourth year. That's okay. It's not too late to develop some of these things. Uh, that's why you're here. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, look forward to talking about that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why we work or volunteer or both. Uh, and sort of three concepts jumped out to me, networks, friends, and skills. So I work in volunteer uh, in great part to develop professionally relevant networks to me. Um, I really value the, the fellow career counselors who I know across Canada. I know people who I can pick their brains, you know, if there's a trouble, a problem, a, an issue that I can't solve. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet new people. Uh, especially at the start of my career, I worked a lot of contracts and I really enjoyed the opportunity to uh, meet people in all kinds of different post-secondary uh, institutions, colleges and universities where I was working. So I'm a big fan of working and volunteering for meeting new people. And of course, we work and volunteer to build skills. Now, some of those skills will be career-oriented skills, and some of those skills are going to be just for fun. So for example, um, I once volunteered on the condo board uh, in my building uh, so I could learn gardening. Selfishly, I wanted to spend more time with the groundskeeping team. Uh, it, it didn't work. I, I, I have one plant and it's barely alive. Uh, and I have to have a reminder on my phone to water it or it would just die. But anyway, I, I wanted to. I really wanted to, to learn how to take care of plants. Uh, so I want to introduce everybody to um, a stereotypical career development timeline. Now, of course, this will vary person by person. So I don't want you to Say, oh my gosh, I haven't done all of these things. That's okay. Not everyone will have done all of these things. Uh, but I just want to give you a sense for what employers or graduate schools may expect you to have on your CV or your resume, whatever the case may be. The uh, uh, department, let me try that again. The person looking at your application may actually be interested in starting with your high school experience. And of course, that depends on where you are. If you're in first year university, obviously your high school is still going to be very relevant. If you're on the cusp of graduating, or maybe you are going to be a November grad, welcome and congrats. Uh, obviously, your university experience is probably going to be a little, of a little bit more interest because it's more recent. High school might be five or six years you know, behind you. Uh, but assuming that you know, maybe you're in first, second, even third year, high school is still very relevant. Um, a recruiter, uh, whether it's for employment or grad school, may be interested in your 40 or more volunteer hours. Those of you who have gone to high school in Ontario know that um, uh, you had to do uh, 40 or more hours um, of volunteer experience. Uh, in addition, you may have been involved in clubs, the band, drama, student government. Okay, so those could be still very relevant early on in your career. Uh, if you're an international student, that's fabulous. You probably have some volunteer work from your high school or clubs or band. If you don't have any of those, that's okay. There is still time to catch up now that you're here in university. So in your early university career, again, a, a recruiter might expect to see in your first or second year, maybe a part-time job, definitely a summer job and or some volunteering experience. So early in university, those are things that they're going to expect to see. So if you're applying for a job again in your second year, maybe looking for an internship or you're a co-op student looking in co-op, um, these would be the kinds of things that, that uh, an employer might expect you to see. Not necessarily tons of stuff, but a little something. Uh, and then as we, get, as we get to the end of your university career, uh, a recruiter might expect to see throughout your university history, 
uh, some kind of co-op or internship or course-based kind of realistic projects. Many of our professors have connections in community. So many of you have done or will have done uh, projects in conjunction with community organizations and or part-time jobs and or summer jobs. Uh, and or um, relevant volunteering. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be all of those things, but again, typically a, a recruiter is gonna to expect to see a few of those things uh, in addition to, um, or um, supported by, there we go, university engagement. And what do I mean by university engagement? That could mean lots of different things. Um, overall, what we're talking about is being engaged on campus, being focused and present in what you're doing. So things like sports, things like clubs, Things like leadership programming, all the fabulous stuff that you see um, in uh, the Office of Student Experience and Student Life. Hobbies, don't give up your hobbies. Sometimes you get really deep into a hobby. Uh, if you sit down with me at some point, I can tell you the, the interesting story of a young man who was all about ball hockey, uh, who decided late in his university career that he wanted to be a doctor and he did end up getting into medical school. So <laughs> sometimes it's just deep into you know something it is that you love and you end up building all kinds of skills and and characteristics that, that recruiters are actually interested in for their program or for their organization. So let's do a quick brainstorm in the chat box if we could. Uh, what do you notice all of these things have in common? I'm pretty sure there are no wrong answers. Uh, so feel free to just throw anything there in the chat box. What do you notice all of those kinds of activities have in common? Part-time jobs, summer jobs, clubs, sports, what do they have in common? Dedication, absolutely. That's a great one. Skills development, you bet. What else? Willingness to engage, absolutely. Motivation. Their life experiences, growth. I love the word growth, absolutely. Hey, you can get excited about something, definitely. Ooh, responsibility, I like that one. Extracurricular engagement, absolutely. Commitment, oh, I like that word, that's awesome. Thank you, yeah, so I'll share what I, what I occurred to me, leadership, I love leadership. So what it seemed to me that they have in common is that all of these things present opportunities for adding to your networks and adding to your collection of skills. And you could break these skills into two categories, I usually would, so there's the interpersonal skills, which are the skills between you and me, things like communication, empathy, and so on. And then there's the intrapersonal skills. And those are the skills that you develop for managing yourself. And those are things like organization, planning, your ability to get yourself from point A to point B on time, things like that. So with that, um, I would like to turn the uh, program over to my colleague, Wei, who will be our moderator today. Um, I encourage you to follow us on social media if you enjoy today's event so that you can hear about all of our other ones. Uh, and with that way, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm, uh, my name is Wei. I work at AACC and I with a focus on experiential learning. Basically, experiential learning means learning through experience. So I'm very happy to be the moderator for this panel talking about um, why experience and what are the experience and how to get experience. And um, also, I'm very happy to have our two guest speakers join us in this panel. Um, we have Claire and Jordan. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Please. Jordan, please. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Wei. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Jordan. I'm really excited to be here to participate in today's call. And I want to thank the UTSC team for inviting myself on behalf of Metrolinx to you know, share a little bit about our approach to working with new talent and, and uh, how all of you can sort of approach you know, your um, graduation or even, you know, experience prior to graduation. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm the new talent program manager at Metrolinx. Uh, in this role, I focus on three main areas. Uh, the first would be the talent acquisition or the hiring of our new talent. That would include co-ops, interns, as well as summer students, and then some research fellows as well. The second main area would be program planning for our new talent. So what the learning journey looks like for a co-op or for an intern when they do have a placement at Metrolinx. And then the last would be university partnerships. So things like research partnerships, uh, working with different profs or, or different uh, faculties to have our professionals come in and do talks or chats about specific skills. 
um, that's another main area that myself and our team focus on. Uh, I've been working in student services for around 11 years, uh, always sort of adjacent to higher ed. So I've been working on the employer side of things, uh, as I mentioned most recently with Metrolinx, but prior to this, I was with AMD, managing their new talent program, uh, as well as prior to that with CPA Ontario, uh, working on their student services team, helping business students really understand the CPA professional education program and really what it takes to get those hours to become a CPA. Thank you, Jordan. It sounds like you have a lot of experience working with students and help them develop careers. Uh, welcome. And Claire? All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Claire Westgate. I currently work with the Master of Science in Sustainability Management Program, actually based at the Institute for Management and Innovation out at the UTM campus at U of T. Uh, and working for that master's program, I do a couple of things. Uh, I do all of our sort of student career uh, support, co-op and uh, company partnerships, but I also am uh, heavily involved in our admissions process. And so I'm going to be wearing that hat today when we're sort of talking about experience and maybe getting into grad school in the future. Uh, a little bit of context. Um, I noticed there's a lot of psych grads in the room, my undergrads in psych and my master's degrees in education, specifically in school work transitions. Uh, I've worked at U of T for 15 years, I think. Uh, previously, I've been in, working for the master's program for quite a number of years. Before that, I worked in career services uh, and actually ran a program for a number of years around getting, helping people get experience. And before that, I worked as a corporate recruiter for a year. So I've kind of been a little bit more in post-secondary, but some of that corporate experience as well. So I'm, uh, like Jordan said, super thanks for inviting us. We're happy to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Claire. Really appreciate you can bring your recruiting experience from all different kinds of backgrounds. And welcome again. Um, again, I just want to, on behalf of students, thank both of you taking your time, spending your time with our students today and sharing your recruiting perspectives. Okay, without further ado, let's start with our questions. So as we learned from Jen's presentation, all types of experience really are valuable. Um, and that's what we as career counselors and career advisors, we always encourage students to get involved, to get all the di different experience. However, not always they can do that because of the academic priority. So our first question is, from your perspective, why does experience matter? Um, let's start with Claire. Thanks. I will come at this from both my professional answer and also I grew up in a house where anything less than an A was unacceptable. You know, I, the academic stress was super, super high and like, Claire, you got to go to medical school. I didn't go to medical school. Um, so there is, I, I fully understand from both a professional and personal perspective, you know, trying to balance grades and academic achievements with everything else that you do. Uh, when it comes to experience, I think there's a couple of points I'd like to make. One, your academic journey is part of your experience. So don't think of them as being separate. The things that you're doing for school make up part of your experience and, and what you know, what your, your skills will become. Um, but there's a couple of real levers that getting experience uh, pulls. One is it builds skills. We talked about that a little before Jen mentioned it, you know, building both intrapersonal, interpersonal and, and technical skills and, and things that you can say to an, uh, an employer or in our case, a graduate school, I can do X, I know about Y. Right. Um, and you're building knowledge. Um, you can do lots of things, but getting experience so that you are familiar with some concepts outside of just the textbook is a, a really important lever as well. Um, I would say that, you know, building experience is important. Maybe even the most important thing is that you learn about yourself and you learn about your the way that you operate as a person and your goals and you can try stuff and see how you feel about different subject matters or different skills um, you can figure out what makes you tick as a person what motivates you what excites you what gets you out of bed every morning you know it's not always first year calculus but sometimes it is so getting different types of experience can help you really figure out a lot about yourself um, and that will give you confidence in your future decisions. So four years later, when you're rolling up to Metrolinx with your job application ready, you feel confident that you, you know, have explored yourself and you, and you know what you wanna do with your career at some point. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the importance of experience is it does provide proof points. So when you're applying to grad school, or you're applying to work you know, with a company, um, there's some proof points on your resume that say, I gained this skill doing this sport, 
I gained this piece of knowledge in this, you know, capstone project that I did in school. I gained, you know, um, time management skills when I worked that summer job at McDonald's. Um, those are proof points where you can say to a, a graduate school uh, admissions committee or an employer, you can check these off the list. I've really done them before. So, so yeah, building skills and knowledge, uh, providing proof points, and really taking those experiential opportunities to learn about yourself and what you care about, I think, are really important. Thank you. I really like your point. The benefit of part of the skill is knowing yourself. And as a teacher, that's what I always believe in. Um, mm -hmm. Think about, oh, I don't know what I like. I don't know what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. Lack of exposure, lack of experience, right? So that's a process. Yeah. Well, and maybe I can, sorry, I can just add to that. There's a lot of pressure when you go to university. You know, I'm sure that everyone's parents are saying, what are you going to do with that degree? And you're like supposed to have an answer, you know? And so when you, when you've had a chance to really view your university years as a time to explore and try things and like drink deeply from the fountain of all these things that U of T offers you, um, there's that in and of itself is just such an important step to take. Um, so yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, try it out, try all different kinds of experience. And I cannot help uh, just informing all the students. After you try out, if you want to talk to someone to make sense of your experience, reflect on your experience, come to Career Center, talk to career counselors uh, as we do one on one appointments. Okay, uh, Jordan. Uh, thank you. And first off, I just want to say those are really great points that Claire made. And, and you know, I want to reiterate about that really learning yourself and using experience, really understand what you like and what you don't like. I think that's so important and it can save you a lot of time. Um, so definitely that's that's a one point that, um, you know, also I wanted to touch on and I think is so important. Um, two other areas that I think, you know, is really important and why experience matters is one, it can help build your network. And two, it's a great differentiator between yourself and your classmates. So where I'm going to focus this and my angle is really not on, you know, that full-time employment or that co-op internship, because I think that really is the goal for a lot of students here is, hey, you know, I don't have a lot of experience. How do I get those paid opportunities like a co-op or even, you know, postgraduate employment? And I think, you know, all types of employment, if you can communicate it effectively when you're in an interview or on your application, is such an important differentiator between you and your classmates. Post-secondary education does a fantastic job of providing a highly structured environment for you to learn, as well as work integrated learning. Um, and you, know, you will graduate with a similar portfolio or a similar resume to a lot of your classmates if you don't go outside of the four walls of your classroom to really get that differentiated experience, which then differentiates you from other applicants. So, don't look, you know, down upon or differently at unpaid experience, volunteer experience, all these things, campus experience, because those are the things that are going to differentiate you from the people that have very similar credentials to you who have gone through a similar program and are likely applying to the same co-op internship or post-grad opportunities that you are. Uh, the next that I want to, you know, touch on is network. Um, I think it's the most valuable piece uh, beyond the whole, you know, skill development that we talked about skill development, understanding yourself, building your network. Uh, there's only so much you can do alone, especially as an, uh, sort of emerging talent or, or new to your career. Uh, your network is gonna be the biggest help in getting you through that door or getting you noticed or providing you opportunities. So anything you can do to build your network, get to know people within industry or even outside of the industry that you're aiming for, um, they may have connections themselves. They may be references down the line. Building your network is huge. Um, even if it's not these tight mentorship relationships that we classically think of when we're like build your network, if it's just connecting with people on LinkedIn, you'll then start getting exposed to the articles they're promoting, you know, the learning that they're promoting, and all that is good stuff for you to put into your tool belt when you're going on job interviews or, or creating your applications. So in short, I'd say, you know, experience is a great differentiator. If you're really, um, I guess you'd say strategic about how you are differentiating yourself from your classmates. And also it's super important to building your network. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, I really like the term differentiator. Let's just remember your experience is your differentiator. And because otherwise you all graduate from the similar program. What makes you different from other students, right? 
Um, so you touch on that. Our second question actually is what types of experience do you value as a HR admission, a professional or admission officer? And um, because we talk about all kinds of experience like volunteer, co-op or internship, I know sometimes it depends on industry, but anything um, you can add, I, I'll start with Jordan, just continue here. Sure, happy to. So I think, you know, going back to a little bit of what I mentioned before, all experience is valuable. I think it comes down to how you can effectively communicate it either on your applications or during an interview. Um, so obviously, you know, experience related to your degree within the field of study that you're looking to obtain a role in, gold standard, I think that speaks for itself, but really understanding how the variety of experiences that you pick up, you know, on campus, outside of campus, volunteer experience, how you can communicate all of that either on your application or on your resume or on your cover letter. Because as we mentioned, there is so much value in all your experience, not just that classic sort of gold standard paid experience that you know we're all hoping to get either during your, your uh, degree or even following. So I think the, the key is not what experience, it's how you effectively communicate it. Um, and yeah, I'd say that's in short, um, the most important piece that, that I would you know, provide to students. Yeah, that is so true. The, it's not about what, it's about how. And we'll definitely save our last question to ask more strategy and tips how to present your experience. Um, Claire? Mm -hmm. I wanna pick up exactly from where Jordan left off there because I, I totally agree. Um, there is almost always something transferable in everything that you've done and everything that you will do. But the big trick is figuring out how you communicate that. If you can't see that it's transferable, then grad school admissions can't see that it's transferable and the employer can't see that it's transferable. So there's really some unpacking to do there. If you say, well, I only, I only coached kids soccer. Yeah, but there's so many transferable skills from that that I'm interested in as a grad school advisor, like teamwork and patience and organizational skills and diplomacy when you're trying to coach a five-year-old on how to kick a ball. You know, there's, there are very transferable things there. And, and I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Jordan, but I'm sure he's got some similar thoughts around, you know, what if those skills are transferable for the, the market? Um, so being able to communicate those, because no matter what kind of experience you've got, there's something there. There definitely is. Um, what, from a grad school admissions perspective, you know, we're interested in a lot of different things that we've touched on. One of the things to think about is what kind of graduate program you're applying for. If you're, if you're thinking of a research program versus a professional program, those programs may be interested in slightly different emphasis on certain types of experience. So for example, your research stream program may be really, really interested in your technical skills. The program that I recruit for is a professional stream program. And while we're interested in technical skills, we're really interested in interpersonal skills, uh, passion, curiosity, things like that. So, so know where you're applying, um, whether it's a job or a grad school that you're looking at, um, and try and get a gauge on what, what matters to them. And that will help you figure out what type of experience you need to highlight on your resume. But I think one of the important things uh, to think about is the list is long. We often think the list is short. A job. If I've never had a paid job in the field, I have nothing. Not true. Uh, jobs, yeah, of course. Part-time, full-time. Uh, somebody mentioned work-study jobs in the chat. Love that. Um, TA jobs, RA jobs, things like that. Um, yes. But volunteer experience and the gamut of volunteer experience can be long. It can be something as sort as you know, once uh, once every six months you do a shoreline cleanup, all the way to you know, every week you're volunteering, you know, um, doing whatever in your community. Um, the cool thing about volunteer work is you don't have to do it; you chose to. And that tells me something about your motivation, right? Um, same thing with sort of leadership and extracurriculars, clubs and groups. You don't have to be the president of the group, uh, but if you join and you're active and you participate in their events, again, nobody's making you do that. You chose to do it. And that says something about your motivation. Um, sports, sometimes people don't think too much about sports. When we are uh, admitting people into our program, I will say people that have played varsity sports and have some of the best time management skills we ever see. So there, you know, it's not about hitting the volleyball. It's about all of the things that enabled you to do that while you studied in school. So, so again, tell me that story in your application. Don't assume that I know it but sports can be really great. Uh, any group work that you've done, case competitions, group work, you know, group projects in school, everybody's seen the hilarious memes about like 
you have one group member that's not pulling their weight, but what was your role in your group and what did you do? And you can talk about that on your resume. Um, if you've traveled, if you've done an exchange, those kinds of things can be really interesting as far as cross-cultural experience and exposure. Um, and then of course, there's the academic bucket. I would be remiss from a grad school perspective, we didn't talk about academic experience. Um, papers, course projects that you did, what did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? Those are really interesting things to see on a resume. Um, and any practical experience, you know, I think way you touched on it before around some of the practical in-course learning um, from a professional stream program, I'm interested in if you've done case projects, if you've done any client-based projects, if you've done anything like that, that's sort of hands-on in the classroom. So, so that's a long list. That's a lot more than part-time jobs. Um, and you can't just throw it on your resume and hope for the best, go to the career center, get them to help you with your wording. Um, but there's so many uh, uh, transferable skills that come out of those. And the last thing I'll say about those is they're stackable. So sometimes it can feel really intimidating, right? I'm sure there's somebody on the call who's like, there, that's a really long list and I'm stressed out just thinking about it. You just need to start, do one thing. And in first year you get, you know, you join one club and maybe you do one volunteer day. That's two things you didn't have six months ago. And then from those two things, you're going to get skills and experience that maybe that's going to help you get that first part-time job. And the part-time job plus something that you did in school, maybe that's going to help you get your first summer job and it's going to stack. You're building a foundation, right? So all of those experiences, totally stackable, totally transferable. That's what I want to say about that. Great. I can visualize that scaffolding plan, like take small steps, right? Step by step. It will get easier once you have more experience. Yeah. Um, so at this point, have two, um, we asked two out of our five questions. Let's um, pause here to open the floor to students. Uh, any questions from the audience, from the students in the chat box? I saw one question away, maybe if I can. Uh, one yeah. of the students asked about if I'm an international student, what's a good job for an international student with no experience? My response would be anything on that list I just gave you. Whether it's paid or unpaid or volunteer extracurricular work study jobs on campus can be a really great place to start because they're low pressure. Um, but anything on that list, international students, domestic students, you know, we're, we're all students trying to build our resumes. So any of those things, I think. Yeah, and keep in mind as international students, you already have this huge transition experience where if you unpack that, there's a tons of skills underlying that, right? So sometimes the ex experience even can be personal experience. And that's why when we say transferable, it's not only transferable from jobs to jobs, but also transferable from life to jobs. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, students? Jen, there was one other one I noticed, and this is a really common one. And I see like Jen's made some text back about it in the chat around, even if you have experience, you feel like you fall short compared to your peers. We could probably have a whole session on imposter syndrome. <laughs> right? I see Jordan's like, yeah, I'm with you on that one, right? Like that idea of, you know, we're, we're all at this incredible institution. You're all brilliant. You're here. You got into this, these incredible programs you're in. You know, it can feel like all these people are so much smarter or so much more experienced than me. I think the way you said it so perfectly before around everybody's got a unique experience. And Jordan talked about your differentiators. You're not competing against each other. It's not you versus the next student. You're all carving out these amazing career journeys one stackable thing at a time. And I think Jen made a really good point around connecting in with the Career Center staff. Sometimes the best thing to do is sit down with somebody who's a, a third party observer to what you've done so far and what your plans are, and they can help you unpack it. And you will feel the light bulbs going off where you think, holy smokes, I do have good experience. I do feel confident in my abilities. It doesn't happen overnight, but I would really encourage you to use the staff and the services that U of T provides uh, to help kind of cheerlead you through it. The fact that you're even here in this session like A plus, A plus. Definitely, yeah. Thank you for helping promoting our services, yeah. And I also, if, if you don't mind, I just want to, it was a question earlier on in the chat around if a student's not in a, a registered co-op program or if their degree possibly doesn't have a co-op option. Um, I'd suggest looking at companies or organizations that have dedicated summer student programs. Um, often Metrolinx is one of them, for example, we have a dedicated co-op program for students that have a registered co-op opportunity embedded in their degree. We also have a summer student program for students, all students enrolled in Canadian post-secondary education. So, you know, get out there, take a look at different organizations. There's a lot of options for students that also don't have that registered co-op route to go to. 
Yeah, that's a great idea. I always encourage students to, especially they have a targeted organization. Usually it's a big organization they're targeted. And usually in big organizations like hospitals, banks, government, they have a separate career sections called student section and then explore what do they offer. Uh, like Medtronic's um, children list a lot of a variety of programs for students. Yeah. Any other back to... I'm just looking at the most recent one. Maybe one of the things I'll, I'll maybe add uh, way as you're looking through the questions um, and to Jordan's point, you know, a lot of amazing organizations, Metrolinx is one of them, have just a bevy of engagement opportunities there. But one of the things that I think can be overwhelming is not knowing where to start if you're a student. You're sort of on Google, like, job for me like you know I'm not really sure kind of where to start and Jordan referenced earlier around you know building a network and chatting with people a part of this entire process of getting experience is doing some research digging around and just reading about what different organizations are doing reading about what different grad programs are doing you know if you're interested in grad school see if you can have a 20 minute virtual coffee with somebody who's a grad student start there and you they'll they'll it'll just sort of make everything a little bit more palatable and it'll make it less intimidating for you. And same thing on the job side, you know, if you really think maybe like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use Jordan as an example, but maybe you really think you wanna, you're really interested in transportation and how people move around cities, right? Somebody like Jordan can probably give you 20 minutes and share with you a little bit of perspective. And the more conversations you have like this, the more accessible all of these ways of getting experience, trying to make some group plans, the more accessible it's gonna be for you. You're not gonna figure it out by staring at your own feet at two in the morning at home by yourself. You're gonna figure it out by talking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We do have a question here. We went. I went back to school at twenty after being a flying attendant for Air Canada for four years. How does having experience previous to university looks like for employer? Jordan, yes, can comment on that. Yeah, happy to. And before I jump into this question, I actually just want to add on to what Claire mentioned before because I think it's really important. Uh, around building that network and and you know oftentimes when we think about building our network we're like well how as a student am i gonna you know connect with someone who makes hiring decisions uh and then get 20 minutes of their time but it doesn't need to be like that uh you know people that are your colleagues or your peers now just a year older than you are going to graduate a year ahead of you likely and they're going to be moving into positions employers have different programs to help connect you or to help basically allow current employees, you know, provide recommendations on, on hires. So definitely don't just think of, you need to connect your network or build your network of people that make current hiring decisions. Build your network because you never know who's gonna be in what position, who's gonna know who, work for who, and be able to really make a recommendation on your behalf. So I know, from someone who's worked in a variety of organizations, one of the best ways to promote your co-op opportunities is to have campus ambassadors. So co-ops who just completed their term at your company that go back to campus and act as a company representative. So there's so much value in also connecting with you know, your peers that are close to you, not just focusing on how do I build my network of you know, people in these hiring decisions. So I just wanted to add that piece. Um, but moving back to the question around experience prior to, you know, going into post-secondary, uh, I think, again, it, it connects back to how you can communicate it. All experience, there's going to be value there. We've covered that, whether it's time management, you know, whether it's a variety of other things you did in your role. So it's all about, again, you know, how you communicate it. And, you know, I wouldn't look differently at someone who had direct entry to post-secondary from high school or someone who had experience before in the sense of, you know, any sort of negative connotation around that. Um, experience is always valuable. So I see it as a, as, as a really a positive. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that would definitely help you in regard to moving forward and, and being able to get co-op internship or even post-grad employment once you do complete your degree program. Thank you. And I really like your comment in terms of networking. It doesn't have to be only with hiring managers or recruiters, right? Although they are very popular on LinkedIn. And um, on that note, we talking about our programs. We have a program called Chat with Professionals. We actually invite alumni. Uh, sometimes it not, doesn't have to be alumni. Basically, professionals out there in all different industries to come back to share their career journey. It's a great opportunity for you if you are still exploring careers and also um, starts with some connections. 
And sometimes all it takes just a, a one employee mention your name to the manager uh, to take out your resume, look at two more minutes. That makes a huge difference, right? It doesn't have to be you, you need to be close friends. And no, it just you need to be out there. Yeah. Um, maybe I can maybe I can jump in on that and just add, you know, I think when we talk about networking and building a network, I always sort of joke with our students in our grad program, like I say the word network and they run through the hills, right? Because it, it gives you this idea that you're gonna be stuffed into a suit and like awkwardly shaking hands and I don't know what to say. And it's a it can be a very overwhelming idea. And I think, you know. When you're first starting out trying to get experience and you're first feeling you know not totally settled in your career plans maybe you don't have a clue what you want to do you know the points around you know if you're chatting with hiring managers great way to go also just chatting with anybody about anything outside of your immediate friends and family and asking them about you know what did you do when you started school and how did you figure out what you wanted to do with your life and you know what was the most fulfilling experience that you had you know back in the day when you started your career or whatever and and just how, having those sort of professional mentorship style conversa um, conversations, it can really give you all kinds of ideas that you wouldn't have come up with on your own. They're super not intimidating because when you're having a mentorship style conversation, there's no job on the line, right? I mean, your professional reputation obviously matters, but you know, you don't have to feel that pressure of like being in a job interview. And, and those kinds of conversations can really help you to you know, have those light bulb moments about what you might like to do next and think about where you might like to go. Um, and they're incredibly valuable. My students get sick and tired of hearing me talk about the value of what we call informational interviewing, but I would recommend it to every single human on this call. It's a, it's a really great way. It's, it's exactly what sort of Jordan was saying, you know, um, so really want to echo that. I think it's a really valuable use of your time as you're moving through this experience job cycle. Yeah, information interview. I think it's one of the terms we use most frequently uh, in our field. But I always um, encourage students, you don't have to call it informational interview. If, if you don't know if the other person know what's that, uh, it may scare them away as an interview. Just call it career chat, right? Just to, like approach someone on LinkedIn to say, I'm curious about your career. Can we have a coffee chat? And nowadays, virtual coffee chat makes it even more convenient. Sometimes people are welcome this kind of interruptions. Uh, people love to talk about themselves or jobs or, yeah, so definitely. And for particular sub sectors, you know, like if you were having your coffee chat, say with Jordan, you might be able to say, if I was really interested in getting into, you know, the urban transportation space, what would you recommend that I take for electives? Yeah. What kinds of things do you think I should study? Like, what advice do you? So you can ask some specifics that may help you sort of crack a nut in a particular area. You know, I know we had one student that was talking about sort of pivoting totally from poli sci to something different. You know, talking to somebody who's you know five or ten years ahead of you in the in the career path, they can give you some really cool ideas that you might not have thought of. Definitely. Thank you so much. I know we are not um, networking, but networking is so important um, thing to really get comfortable with, right? Um, our question three, actually, again, both of you touched on that already. I'm just gonna ask for anything to add. It's particularly about uh, what is your view on volunteering versus paid experience? Do both experiences have value on application? Because from student side, uh, even I know when I critique their resume, they are concerned about their volunteer uh, sometimes they don't even want to say it's a volunteer on the resume. Um, yeah, any comments on that? Uh, I guess we'll start with Claire this time. Yeah, sure. I think I sort of um, alluded to this before, but when you volunteer, nobody's making you do it, right? Often we have part-time jobs because we need a job. Like we need to pay rent and bills and things. So, you know, even as much as we have jobs that we love and it's my passion, you still need a job to pay the bills. Volunteering is a bit of a different kettle of fish. Right? Um, you're doing it because you chose to. You had available hours in your week, and this is how you chose to spend them. And, you know, from a, uh, when I put my grad school admissions hat on and sort of think of it that way, that, you know, and, and way actually, I think it was way Jen referenced earlier around, you know, really engaging in your campus community or your local community or do, you know, in our case, we're admitting students for sustainability master's programs. When we see volunteer work that's around social justice or environmental awareness or doing something to make your community better. I can't teach you to want to make your community better. I can teach you calculus and I can teach you business plans and I can teach you marketing, but I can't teach you to care. So some of those volunteer opportunities are really special because they play that role. Again, you know, and Jordan references earlier, you have to tell the story correctly on your resume and your cover letter. You know, it, if you did it just to like check a box, 
most recruiters and most grad school admissions are going to be able to see through that. Um, but when you do those unpaid things, there's, there's a lot to be said. Um, that said, you know, the flip side, paid employment means that you showed up somewhere and you did a good enough job that they gave you money. Um, and that's significant also, right, in terms of building a bit of a professional reputation. It's not that it's not that you, you know, you have to have paid and nothing else. And, you know, so there's definitely a balance when you're starting out for sure. Um, but there's certainly a lot to be said for for both. And I think um, it all comes down to, again, this is what Jordan said so perfectly before around how do you communicate paid, unpaid? What was the outcome? What did you get from it? Um, yeah, Jordan, I don't you want to pick it up from there and. Yeah, absolutely. Just one thing to add, because Claire, you nailed it. But, you know, just to really drive home the importance that there's value to both, but also there's just as much value with volunteer experience. Connecting with Claire said around, you know, this is the extra time you chose to really improve your locale or the community you're in. You know, when I'm thinking about hiring interns or co-ops or summer students for Metrolinx, we're actively trying to build a learning community of students or new grads to go on this journey together. And if you have experience, volunteer experience, where you've spent your time trying to improve your community, that stands out to me as a recruiter because that's something we're trying to do. And, and frankly, all employers are looking for employees that are willing to not just do their job, but also you know, improve the community that they're in or the community that they're building. So again, when we're talking about effectively communicating your experience, if you know, you're on a company or organization's website, they're all about you know, building their community, developing their ERGs or their employee resource groups, all the volunteership that they have available to their employees. This is a theme that they're looking for. So you know, if you have that volunteer experience, tell that story. Thank you. And Claire, I really learned some new angle because uh, usually when I tell students, volunteer and paid is basically the only difference is paid and now paid. But actually the other difference you mentioned is by choice, right? Mm -hmm. Choice is based on value. It shows their value in sustainability or value of supporting community. And that tells a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not teachable, right? Those are things that, you know, if you come to grad school, our profs can only teach you so much. If you go to work at, you know, Metrolinx, Jordan can only teach you so much. There are certain things that you need to bring to the table authentically. And I think, um, you know, this is sort of a little bit an aside from the question, but in your letter of intent for graduate school, or, you know, perhaps in your cover letter that you write when you apply it to a, a job somewhere, one of the key things is being able to articulate your why. Why do you care? Why do you care about this industry? Why do you care about that company? Why do you care about the subject matter that you're going to study in graduate school, right? Saying I want a graduate degree is actually a really terrible reason to go to grad school, right? And, you know, I need a job for money. Yes, but we ideally for you to be happy in your job, you're choosing a company that aligns with your values and your goals and the kind of lever you want to pull in this world. And it's exactly the same with grad school. So I think leveraging those volunteer extracurricular things in your applications, whether for grad school or, or a job, that's going to show us that you genuinely care about these things. And that is going, that tells me at grad school, you're going to end up being a more dedicated student. You're going to do better academically. You're going to contribute to the course. You're going to have a more successful two years when you're with us. And then you're going to graduate and, and have a fast track in your career. So there's a, a bit of a domino effect with that. And those are some of the things that I would say that admissions uh, staff from master's programs and, and probably HR and recruitment folks are looking for um, is, is that sort of, I'd like to bring you into my grad program, I'd like to bring you into my company, but I'd like to be able to set you up for a future here in this space. You know, uh, So trying to get you away from the transactional thinking on this and showing why do you care about, what's the why behind your this application that you've made? Um, and you know, that will come out in an interview process as well, you know, uh, beyond just the application documents. Once you've made it into the interview, we interview for our graduate program. And, you know, here's a little trade secret for you. Once you cross the baseline of grades, like the U of T makes us put in place, I no longer care about your transcript. I care about why you want to do this. Tell me why. Why do you want to study this? What are you excited about? Um, that to me is a much, much, much bigger indicator of how you're going to do in grad school than straight A's. Um, and that I think is something that nobody really says a lot out loud, but it's sort of like grades, 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 but really looking at those, those passion pieces. And so, you know, that's where volunteer and other things can play a big role. Um, Jordan, I don't know if you want to pick up on any of that around like, you know, the, the why, why somebody wants to join a company or maybe the interview process. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the why is so important. Uh, you know, not just so oftentimes, you know, you see sort of a, I guess, a spray and pray approach. People just put out the resume and just hope one sticks and they get an interview. Um, you can generally tell uh, when you're sitting in that interview, it's always best to have that why, that, you know, passion behind why you want to work for that organization, uh, why you want to do that role, how it really connects with your vision for making an impact and, and really where it brings you um, a sense of accomplishment. So having that why is so important. It's more than just a job. It's more than just, you know, having or, or gaining in employment and income. That why is so important. And again, can be a really uh, key differentiator between yourself and another uh, person that you may, may be interviewing for a similar position. Thank you. I was gonna, before you say your last sentence, I was gonna say, I'm gonna use your term. Why is another differentiator <laughs> to make you different from others? Because uh, a lot of people focus on what they can offer, what they can gain, but the why part to connect the values and you need evidence to show your value, which is based on stories. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you know, I use the term differentiator and I, I hope it's not bringing some connotation of competition because I, I know I've seen in the chat and, you know, it's, it's something that everyone everyone deals with that feeling of competition. And by differentiator, we all have our own paths and it's really about highlighting your path because everyone's is valuable. Everyone's has unique you know, uh, skills or, or unique experiences that they can pull and, and really drive, um, you know, drive value from. So um, it's not about competition. It's really just about your uniqueness and being able again to communicate your unique uh, experience. Yeah. Definitely. You are talking about differentiator. You are not talking about what makes you better. You are not what makes you different. Right? That's the key question. Um, our next question is basically um, connect to those who don't have uh, any experience. So what are your suggestions to those students who are seeking to find their first job or volunteer experience? And uh, I will start with uh, Claire. Okay. I think my biggest piece of advice is just start don't spend too much time navel gazing about like oh, I gotta find the perfect thing and it has to be the perfect. I think it's gonna look good on my resume. You just need to start. And if you don't know where to start, start with something you like. If you like knitting, join the knitting club. You know, if you you know, if it can be really something hobby based. And I think Jen referenced this earlier that the you know you can just start somewhere. And once you kind of you know understand what it is to be part of a club or group, and you start to meet some new people in that club or group, the knitting group, let's say, you know, and you start to go to a weekly meeting, you're actually starting to develop those communication skills and those time management skills. And from there, you'll be able to feel a little bit more confident to sort of start to build a little bit more strategic choices that you might make around clubs or groups or volunteering. Um, work study jobs are a great one. Uh, if you've never had a job before, those campus based. 12 to 15 hours a week jobs, you know, university administrators and faculty that are hiring for those jobs, they know you don't have a lot of experience. They know you're a first or second year student. So there, there's, there's a lower intimidation factor there. They also know that you're going to be struggling with midterms and papers and things like that. So there are some, I would say, quick wins, uh, you know, joining a club or group that's just interest-based and maybe looking for work study if you need a little bit of income um, can be a good way to start. Um, I would say also start by talking to people you know, these sort of informal chats that we've talked about. Um, and even if that first person is somebody who, you know, lives in your residence with you or somebody who is at the front desk at the career center, like it can be anybody, uh, just start with, with that kind of thing. And then I would say the, the third thing is, and this is like a shameless plug for Waze team, go to the career center. Um, sit down with a career counselor. They can, if you've never built a resume, please don't go download some crummy template from the internet. Go in and work with a, a career staff to kind of start putting something together and start to unpack. I did this in high school and I'm doing this in my first year course. You know, that staff member can help you start out on the right foot. So I would say just start with anything that you find even remotely interesting. Um, check out more events like this. You know, there's grad school fairs, there's there's job fairs, things like that. Um, and really, you know, you're going to be with the university for a number of years here. And through your student fees, you've paid for all kinds of services. Use them. Use those career staff. They really know what they're talking about. And that is, they didn't pay me to say that. I genuinely believe it. So those would be some of the things I would say to maybe start with. Thank you. We do emphasize a lot of uh, experience. That's part of why we're here to provide uh, support, getting experience. And um, as my, part of my specialty is inspiration learning, I will also let everyone know 
even career center, we do run some of the experiential learning program. Basically those programs will get you some small experience, could be a mini project, uh, could be, um, I actually last, this summer, we just run an experiential learning program, collaborated with our women's and gender study faculty. And the program is help um, women students develop more technical skills, not the huge complicated technical skills. In this case would be um, develop a video to promote some nonprofit services for the community. It's a very meaningful project and uh, students will complete that whole cycle, complete the very um, well-developed video for our YMCA newcomers program. Uh, and you can definitely put on your resume. These are the meaningful experience. It's an, not a job job, but it's a meaningful experience to demonstrate uh, your skills. Okay, uh, Jordan, anything to add? Yeah, well, I wanna reiterate what Claire mentioned about use of resources that are available to you at UTSC. Um, connect with Wei and the team. Uh, you know, I think back to my experience of post-secondary, and I just can't believe how much I dropped the ball in the sense that, you know, I didn't make use of the resources that were available to me. Uh, they're so valuable. And, you know, as mentioned, they're part of your tuition, part of your experience. So really do leverage those, those uh, opportunities and those resources around you. Uh, I'd also, you know, think about your approach to building your network. I know we talked about it before about, you know, building that network, not just people in hiring decisions or people in, in places to make hiring decisions, but, you know, throughout the career journey from your colleagues to experienced, um, experienced employees. But I think about strategic or how you strategically approach connecting with people. I know LinkedIn is probably the most used right now. And I definitely say from an employer is the one we promote our opportunities on most. Um, and I get a ton of messages from students or new grads looking for opportunities. And what I'd suggest is, you know, think about how you can strategically reach out to people within organizations or industries uh, that you're really interested in gaining experience in. And I wouldn't say just target recruiters or, you know, new talent program managers like myself. Please do reach out. Anyone on the call, happy to chat with you. But, you know, like I said, be a little strategic. We get in you like a ton of inbox messages. Maybe, you know, a more direct way would be connecting with someone who, you know, is a few years into their career, alumni from your program. You have a lot to chat about. And, you know, between, you know, a few strategic messages, you can really craft a relationship with this individual who will have, you know, a certain level of buy-in now in your uh career progression. So be strategic, you know, don't just think I need to connect with a recruiter. There's a lot of different individuals that you can build your network and have value in, in learning from. So that's one thing I'd suggest uh, is really getting out there, um, but not just, you know, sending out all those messages to recruiters, thinking deeply about, you know, how you're going to approach building that network and thinking about how you're going to structure your network in the sense of, okay, so I've connected with all these recruiters. How about I connect with some people that are, you know, day to day in the job I'm interested in to get sort of feedback in that area. Um, maybe even some senior level individuals. Uh, I get emails all the time from some of our director and above level employees saying, hey, this really keen student connected with me on LinkedIn. Can you set up a chat with them? So don't just think about it as recruiters on LinkedIn, really strategically build that network. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're talking about there are different layers of network, right? There's direct contacts, there's, there's recruiters, but also there's uh, professionals in the field. But also it could be in any field, any person like Claire saying in a knitting group, uh, you may meet a, another person in a knitting group, know someone in the field you are interested in. You never know. Um, I think if I may, I think that actually is a really good answer to there's a question in the chat around like, how do you get your first job when you have volunteering experience relevant, but no internship. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, what we're addressing here is cracking that nut cycle. And one of the things that I think is so important about what, what Jordan just said is, you know, if you're just going to try and build a network of recruiters, that's very transactional. Right. If there's no job at that time, it's not going to help you. Right. And, and um, one of the things that I have learned over time is that when you are authentic and you're really interested in a given area and you're, you know, reaching out to make connections with people's brains um, and you're asking for mentorship and advice and you develop a really authentic, you know, I don't say like long term connection, but, you know, you have these really authentic conversations. People will want to reach out and help you. 
right? So there is a point where let's say, you know, um, I know the student that put the question made uh, uh, notable hospitals, for example, which are notoriously tough to crack because there's so many, there's so many issues at play when you're hiring a hospital environment. But I, I, let's, let's use it as an example for a minute. You know, let's say that you really want to work in hospital administration and you've applied to some jobs there and you're not, you're not getting anywhere. But maybe you've had a couple of coffees with some, some folks who work in the area. Uh, maybe you did, you know, two this month and maybe, you know, two in the next six months. There's a really good chance that at some point, somebody's going to have a job across their desk and they're going to think of you. Or somebody will just give you an opportunity you know, that you weren't necessarily expecting when you've, when you've built a really authentic network. Um, and I say that, you know, that's happened to me. Um, you know, the first job that I interviewed for at U of T way back in the day, um, what I was actually passed over for at the beginning. And then the interviewer was like, wait a minute, there's something that you have that we needed to talk about last time. And I was brought back and I ended up getting this job that was kind of not the thing I had originally applied for, but was sort of through this series of conversations that I've had. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it's not always transactional, like I apply for a job and I get it or I don't get it. That value of building that network that Jordan mentioned can play a role into helping you crack that first nut and somebody giving you your first opportunity. And the other thing I wanted to reference there is that stackability, right? You know, you, it doesn't have to be an internship. It can be a part-time job. It can be, you know, a couple of school projects. It can be a summer job. It can be your first job out of school that's not the slam dunk job, but it's adjacent to where you want to go. So there, there's various things that can play in there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to reference, and, and somebody mentioned about grades um, and feeling like they would just focus so much on grades and hoping they still had time to build experience. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're in a pandemic. The last, you know, if you're not in, even if you're in first year, the last part of high school was rough. And now you're in first year in a pandemic. If you're up, upper in your upper years at university, you've been online for so long. And sort of this idea of having these robust in-class, in-person experiences has been flushed a little bit. So I think one of the big messages that I, I want to drop in here is to be really kind to yourself about this whole, I got to get grades, I got to pass in school people's mental wellness has really been taxed, you know, grades might be slipping online, not be, might be working for you. There's this pressure. I got to go to grad school. My parents said I had to, I got to get a good job. It's good to just pause, acknowledge the situation that we're in. And, you know, the, you will build a plan to get experience with your local career counselor, whoever along the way, maybe some tips from today, but I really want to acknowledge that, you know, it's been a bumpy time. You you always have time. It is never too late. People change jobs like 10 times in a life. And I think it's the average for full career changes, like full 180s is something like three in a lifetime. Um, you always have time. You always have time. It is never too late. Whether it's grad school, grad school is always going to be here. Uh, you know, the Metrolinx is going to be around for a really long time. So, you know, there's always opportunity is what I want to say, like on that note. Sorry, that was sort of a sidebar. I just saw the, the chat and I thought I want to I address this because I think it's important. Thank you. You make my job so easy. I don't even have to look at questions. And then you pick up questions, right? And then we just go with the flow. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, I just want to comment when you say um, doesn't have to be internship. That's so true. I have so many students make, make appointment. The question, key question they come, up, come with is work, how can I find internship? And before I answer, no, we don't have internship programs in UTSC, uh, we always need to step back. Why do you want to get into internship, right? What do you want to get out of that experience? And then talk about skills, they talk about they just want to have experience. And then let's talk about what other different types of experience you can get other than internship or co-op, right? There are so many as we talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Any before we move on to our last question, any more questions from our audience, students? If I missed, I, I didn't really look at the questions because I'm tentatively listening to your talk. <laughs> Maybe, you know, just while we're quickly scanning for questions here, one of the things when people are talking about experience, whether it's the context of grad school applications or job applications, people get hooked up on semantics. The word co-op versus the word internship, summer yeah. job, volunteer, is all experience. And I think, you know, even we, we see some employers sometimes using the terms interchangeably, often smaller, medium employers are using the word co-op. It's not actually a co-op, it's an internship, or it's it's just a really cool summer job. So sometimes people get really hooked up on the semantics, and I would encourage you not to do that. I mean, co-op, the, the actual definition of co-op is you need to be in a co-op approved program, and the employer has co-op positions. It has to do with tax credits and, and sort, of, sort of some framework around that particular headcount, right, and that particular student. So co-op stream is its own sort of thing. Um, but when we get into the word internship or summer job or first job out of school, don't get caught up in the semantics. If you're, you really look at the opportunity, 
where it is, why do you want to do it? Are you excited about it? And do you meet some of the qualifications? Um, don't, you know, for anything, including grad school, you don't always have to hit 100% of the qualifications. I think we tend to talk ourselves out of applying for experiential opportunities, which is a whole nother panel. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, to make that note. And, and sometimes it's unclear to students what the differences are between internship, co-op, summer job, et cetera, et cetera. We are all experiences. That's the key. Um, anything else? Our, uh, I have my colleagues, um, Wendy and Florence here. If I miss any question, feel free to open your mic just to keep in the questions. If not, let's move on to our last question. Again, we kind of touched on that, but this time I'm gonna ask you, for specific tips or strategies um, on application, like resume, I guess in Claire's case would be CV and personal statement. And for Jordan as a recruiter, it's more like a cover letter and resume. How should students present their paid or unpaid volunteer experiences? I'll start with Jordan this time, thanks. Sure. So I think before answering, you know, how you should present your paid or unpaid experience, I think it's valuable to take a step back and really understand how the organization that you're applying to goes about their talent acquisition process. There's a variety of different ways that organizations are approaching this now. Um, some more classic ways, some use different tools to sort resumes and keywords. Uh, others will do really, I wouldn't call them trendy, but newer forms of lifestyle interviews, really focusing on the whole person rather than your academics or your previous experience. So step one is understand the organization that you're applying to and their talent acquisition process. If the first step of, or the first review would be an individual, then maybe it's best that you have a key skills and ability section right at the top of your resume. So that when a person recruiter, whoever hiring manager reviews that resume, bang, the first thing they see are skills that relate directly to the role. If that's not the case, if your application resume is being reviewed in a different manner, maybe you wanna structure it a little differently. I think going back to what we talked about, about you know, creating that network uh, and understanding and getting information about the different organizations that you're interested in can really help get you those pieces of information, which will then allow you to structure your resume in the most effective way to get noticed by that hiring manager or recruiter. So step one, I'd say always is understand the organizations that you're applying to and really try to know their application process because that can really influence the best way to structure your resume and your cover letter. Then when we're looking at, you know, how to actually structure your cover letter or your resume, I always suggest a modular approach. So let's say you are going to be applying to four different companies or organizations. They have four different talent acquisition processes or styles or approaches. Then if you have a modular resume, you can tailor sections or pieces of information on your resume to basically meet how it would be best for each organization to review your application or resume. So, you know, we've touched a little bit on how to, or the value of volunteer versus paid experience, um, you know, where they should go in your resume. Um, but I think having an understanding of who you're applying to and then having a modular resume so that you could tailor it to the best approach for those organizations is a great first step before even considering, you know, how students should be presenting paid versus unpaid experience on their resume. Thank you. I'm going to follow up with a tricky question, uh, which I get from students. So if it's a volunteer and students choose not to say it's a volunteer, just say it's a relevant experience how would you view that? And then in the interview, you find out it's not, it's, it's, but they didn't lie. They said it's related mm -hmm. to an experience. They didn't say it's work experience. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't view it any differently. Again, it's all about how you can effectively communicate it. So if we're talking about, you know, um, team, being a team lead in either a volunteer or a paid experience, you know, the value, the skill set that you gained from that and being able to lead a team and, and really mentor different people and team members, uh, that's real. So it, it, to me, it doesn't matter as a recruiter reviewing your resume, whether it's paid or unpaid. Um, there are some you know, more structured regulated professions that have different nuances 
around that. But I mean, again, it's all about effectively communicating the skills or the experience that you've gained from that, uh, whether it's paid or unpaid. And, you know, it, it's those skills are true. And the dollar amount that you got paid or, or that you didn't associated with that isn't isn't the, the key there. Great. Thank you. And Claire? I want to echo everything that Jordan just said, because those exact same points, they map directly to grad school as well. Um, you know, before you even write your resume or your CV, uh, let's take a, a moment here, a resume and a CV. We're, we're talking about documents that show what you've done, right? CV or uh, curriculum vitae or however you pronounce it is often the academic term that, you know, a little bit more research-based, maybe there's a heavier emphasis on publications, you know, some of that academically heavy stuff when you're applying to grad school. Um, but, but what Jordan said about knowing the company is completely true for grad programs as well. Right. So the program that I uh, am involved with and work for, we're a professional stream program, not research stream. Now you still have to do a thesis, uh, but we're so we're looking for an equal balance on the resume, maybe even more so on the professional side than the research side, because we're not admitting people to do a heavy, heavy thesis. We're admitting people to go into a professional career. So, um, but if you're if you're applying to say this program versus a very research heavy program, you're going to have to present your experience a little bit differently, just like Jordan said around. What does the reader want to see and need to see to assess your candidacy? Um, one of the recommendations that Jordan made was a professional profile section at the top. I love this suggestion. I make it all the time to my students and I like to see it on grad school applications for our program. I, I can't speak for all the others. Often, so let's use sustainability for, a, for an example because that's the program that I work for. If you wanna study sustainability, but you've never worked in it before, that's okay, I just need to see why. Why do you care? And a professional profile at the top that says something about your transferable skills and interests, tell, it's the first thing I see. People read a document top to bottom, left to right. Uh, and, a, and typically a, a recruiter uh, or a grad school admissions advisor is gonna do like a six to 10 second scan of that document before they decide if it's worth reading any deeper or not. So, so having, once you know what I'm looking for, having the content laid out in a way that I can see right at the top, okay, this person, is really genuinely interested in this, this thing that they're asking to study. And then if you can lay it out in a way that makes it easy for me to find what I'm looking for. So, um, you know, I, I like to see a relevant experience and an additional experience or a key sustainability projects or a, you know, relevant professional experience. You can use various different headings and, and so forth. But, but what I'm talking about is that modular approach that Jordan mentioned. So things don't have to be only in chronological order. I did this most recently and this and this and this in order. We can have sections that are, this is the really relevant stuff, most recent to oldest. And then some other stuff I did that's cool, but less relevant is over here on the second page. So for, for graduate school, certainly, I like to see these sort of things, just like Jordan said, in a modular format, but, but lay it out for me in a way that I can have my piece of paper and my pen or my mouse and my highlighter or whatever. Uh, and I can start at the top and go, yeah, yes, okay, good. I can see the relevancy right out of the gate and maybe the less relevant stuff's on the second page. Um, the other thing that I'll say around uh, presenting the paid and unpaid and whatever experience you have from a grad school context, um, and I think the same is probably true for, in fact, I, I know it's true for, for job applications as well. When you're writing that letter of intent or you're writing a cover letter, a letter of intent, um, don't just regurgitate your resume. I have your resume. I can see what's on it. Tell me in that letter why. What are the most important things that you've done that you want to tell me about in that letter? And that letter shows me one that you can write and you can and commu you can communicate, which I can't do in this moment, but which you know you can communicate. And Jordan referenced this earlier as well, right? The importance of, of being able to tell your story. Um, so tell me what, what it is you want to tell me, and then tell me why you told me, right? So you explain something in your letter of intent about some experience that you had, and then put a little linking statement on the end of that paragraph that says, you know, this is going to help me in this grad program because of X, Y, and Z. This has really sparked my interest. And so X, Y, and Z is what I'd like to do in grad, in grad school. You can use a similar approach with companies. It helps me as the reader say, holy smokes, this person has not only done something, they've thought about why it translates. And that makes my job as an admissions you know, uh, officer really easy. I go, yeah, we're gonna interview this person. And I go right into the yes pile. Um, notice that none of that was about grades, right? It was, it was about how do we talk about our experiences? How do we uh, uh, categorize them in a way that makes them appealing to the reader. And what's what's interesting to me may be different than a different research stream master's program. And that will be different again from different types of companies. 
So, you know, to, I'll finalize, you know, last thing I'll say about that is what Jordan said first, which is know your audience. Use those research skills that you have as, as students. Thank you. Know your audience. That's another key thing you want to remember. Um, a follow-up question would be, how can we do the research to know more about employers or the schools? What are there, when we talk about the why, actually I got this question this morning from a one-on-one -on -one appointment. I think the student just start to write a cover letter, uh, no clue how to talk about why. Um, and she told me the honest reason why is because it's a great, it's a big bank basically, right? But the reason she chose to say is something uh, the bank also value charity work. And then she said, I value too but it sounds like cliche. Um, so what are your, any examples? Like what kind of examples you read in the cover letter personal statement? Really, uh, you find oh, this is a very sincere why. Yeah, um, Jordan, thanks. Sure, so uh, first I, I just want to reiterate one thing that Claire mentioned because it is so important that the resume and your cover letter are two different pieces of information. So, you know, your resume is going to be point form and your cover letter shouldn't just be paragraph style of the information that's on your resume. Uh, really think of it as the opportunity to bring color to that black and white point form text. Maybe some of you have colored resumes, that's a, a different conversation, but uh, really it's the opportunity to, to tell that story, tell that why. And I'll go back to some of my recent experiences recruiting for AMD, my previous employer, as well as my current employer, Metrolinx. So at AMD, uh, they build the computer chips that power most of the computers a lot of you are using now, as well as things like the PlayStation, Xbox, all that you know, high-tech gadgets and goodness. So one of the things that was really powerful on cover letters is when students applying to our co-op or internships would let hiring managers know their history using our products, their passion about the products that we create and the applications of them. Another example using my recent employer, Metrolinx. So a lot of what we do, subway expansions, uh, light rail, all these things are what we call like legacy projects. They're gonna be there for decades. And you know, when a student can really describe in their cover letter why they wanna work on such legacy projects, that really pops to a hiring manager. So again, it's not just about putting that point form information on your resume in a paragraph format. It's your vehicle for telling that story, telling that why. And I think making it as personal as you can for the cover letter is a really great approach and one that I've seen. And I think one that stands out in this increasingly digital world. So I think those are some tips that, that I would uh, try to attempt as a student. Great, thank you. Thank you for the great examples. And Claire? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, it, it's interesting what, what we're seeing through this conversation. And, and you know, I, I hope it, that the students are picking up on this is that a lot of the patterns that we adopt as best practices for, for employers are similar for grad school. You know, you're really, you're we're really talking about authentic purpose driven approaches here, right? Um, for some best practices in terms of your letter of intent, um, when we're reading letters that people have written to us about why they want to study in the MSCSM program, um, it is typically obvious to me if someone has really done their homework. So in our case, if you've talked to a couple of students that are currently in the master's program, if you've talked to a couple of former students who graduated and are out changing the world, if you've talked to a couple of faculty, that is, it's going to become very obvious to you right away um, why you want to study in this program. And when you in the top of your letter can say, you know, through conversations with these alum, I've learned that your program is doing X and Y and Z. And, you know, I understand the philosophy is A and B and C, and this aligns with my value system because of these reasons. Um, that's a, more or less a slam dunk. I can tell that you've taken the time to do the research and really make a, a educated choice about applying to this program. It wasn't just, you know, to, to use Jordan's term earlier, it wasn't just a spray and pray approach or a I'm gonna to apply to 50 grad programs and I hope I get in because I just want a grad degree. Those applications are quite obvious when we see them. Uh, there's not a lot of personalization to them. Sometimes people make the cardinal mistake of car like copying and pasting the same letter to different programs. We see it with employers as well and they've not changed the name of the company or they've not changed the name of the master's program. Instant flush, you know, that, that's not 
that tells me you're not really serious. So, so one of my biggest, biggest pieces of advice around the grad school journey, um, if you're thinking of going to grad school, you're talking about committing money, many, many dollars, uh, and more time of your life for further, further education. We want to see in that application that you're ready and you're really intrinsically driven because it's a big commitment. And, and starting by talking with current students and former graduates of any master's program is a really, really good way to set the light bulbs off in your mind. And then when you start to write that letter of intent, it's going to come out so much better um, because you'll have had a chance to connect the dots for yourself. And, um, you know, generally with a grad program, you can start by talking to an admissions officer or whoever the graduate program coordinator is, uh, you know, there's usually, it's usually fairly easy to find those staff on those graduate program websites. Um, and I would, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to those people before you apply. Strong, don't, don't just spaghetti at the wallet, really take the extra half an hour to send that email. Um, it can really make a huge difference. Also, the other thing I'll say about this, you know, we might get 300 or 500 applications to our grads program every year. Let me tell you, my colleague who does the vast heavy lifting on our admissions, she knows who every single one is, especially those who've reached out in advance. Maybe they came to visit at a grad fair or they came to an open house day that the program has. She remembers and that goes a long way towards showing commitment. So that's that networking piece that we talked about before. Um, but those are a few things that I would say. Talk to people. That's maybe a write on a post-it stick on your laptop. That's one of the big themes from today. Thank you. And talking to people, um, you're saying you encourage students to talk to grad school admission officers. We actually had this conversation even in our team meeting one day. Um, we kind of know students have some concerns and some of their concern is if I talk to the admission officer, talk about my GPA or whether this is good enough, they may remember me. And then this time remember is a negative note. Mm -hmm. what I think it's the same thing applies to Jordan. If they talk to you, maybe how about they, what about they present not professionally? They worry a lot. So that's why they don't want to even have. So here's, here's an alternative view. What if they think really positively of you? Like that's, it's much more likely that's the case. The other thing I would say is if you're feeling nervous about any of that, again, use the career services staff. They can do practice conversations with you, mock interviews with you. They can like role play a little bit. Okay, let's pretend that I'm the grad school person and you're the student. Okay, what are you going to say? And they can help you understand how to ask questions correctly and how to put your best foot forward. I think, you know, it's important to remember that we're all human. Right. Every, every grad school admissions officer was once also an undergraduate who was like terrified of all of these things. And, you know, I think it's really important to acknowledge, you know, we look around this incredible institution and, you know, it, we have this idea that everyone is just the best at everything. And, and, you know, we're all human. We've all made, you know, different types of uh, mistakes in our path. We've all, all, you know, learn differently as we went, you know, it took me a couple of years to get into grad school because my undergraduate grades were horrific. And I had to acquire enough relevant work experience before I could get into my master's degree. And I made it, you know, I love my job. So I want to really encourage you that there's no textbook plan for this. Uh, it doesn't have to go according to plan right away. Um, and you must remember that all of these conversations are part of the journey and, and not doing them is not going to help you starting and having a conversation and being a little bit scared of it and realizing you survived it will make you stronger and better and faster for the next one. So I think, you know, I've said this before, you just need to start and use those resources. You know, those career coaches will help you every step of the way if you ask. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And um, we are at the time, only one more minute. Uh, and the good thing is I don't see any more questions in the chat. So on this note, um, I know Claire, you help us promote our services a lot. In the final minute, I'm gonna give both of you maybe 30 seconds to talk about what you can offer to students. Um, either it's internship or in, in the program or some co-op or beyond that. Okay, um, Claire, you go first. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I work at U of T. You can all find me. If you Google me, you'll find me online. Um, I would say, you know, my final words of parting are just don't put too much pressure on yourself and follow your gut and be authentic. The pathway will make itself clear. This, and it's not a ladder. This is a jungle gym. Your whole career, grad school, everything. It's a jungle gym. 
it, the pieces will fall into place. I promise you, um, you know, use the resources around you, you know, the career staff, uh, admissions officers, all of those things, and just keep going to these events. You will learn and learn and learn as time goes along. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm Googleable at any time you can find me online. Thank you. And I know your program over internship. That's also. Something. Yeah, we have a, we have an internship slash co-op as part of our master's program. Uh, I'm a huge fan of work integrated learning and all the things we've talked about today, which is part of the reason I work in the program that I work in because I believe so strongly in it. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's an army of people here to support you through your entire academic journey. Thank you, and Jordan? Well, I, I'd suggest, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where we promote all of our co-op, summer student or new grad opportunities. Um, so if you are interested in working for Metrolinks, uh, it's not just transportation focus. We have students in legal marketing uh, all across the board. Um, so yeah, connect on LinkedIn. You'll be able to get exposed to all the different opportunities that you know I'll promote through LinkedIn. And as a closing message, I, I want to connect back to actually a little bit of what Claire mentioned of you know go out there and 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 don't be frozen and and don't think you know just start doing this. And I think you know way you touched on it a little bit that students may be um, a little paranoid that you know if things don't go smoothly or don't go as planned, they'll look negative. And, you know, I don't think this is really like a, a proper term or anything, but it's an approach that has helped me in the past and is practicing instead of paranoia, pro -anoia. So just thinking instead of everything's gonna go bad, if you do the work, if you do the things that we had chatted about today, pro -anoia. things will go well. So as Claire mentioned, be your authentic self, do the work and things will happen for you. So don't be, you know, frozen by that paranoia Try to practice paranoia. Thank you, paranoia. That's a new term learned. And be differentiator and be authentic. Thank you so much, both of you. And again, on behalf of students, really appreciate your time and insights. And let's have a round of applause for really our guest speaker, Mr. Jordan and Claire.